Yo, what's good? STG here, man. If you guys edit music videos on DaVinci Resolve using the PC, then this video is for you. I'm going to be talking about some of the best components that I think you guys should be upgrading to in order to get a more pleasurable editing experience, uh, particularly with music video editing. <music> Now, obviously, most of these computer components that I'm going to be talking about to put inside your PC to have a better music video editing experience can be used for other things like filming weddings or filming like events or whatever. I'm going to be specifically talking about music videos because that's what I primarily edit. Sometimes editing music videos specifically can be a little bit more intensive on your computer than just editing like say an event or even some weddings and stuff like that. Music videos tend to have a lot more cuts, a little bit more special effects involved in the whole editing process. So picking and choosing the components to spend most of your money on within your computer to edit in DaVinci Resolve can be a little bit intimidating, but hopefully this video can kind of clear things up for you. Now, if you're a Premiere Pro user, User, you can most definitely use some of these components and apply it to this upgrade if you're thinking about upgrading some pieces to your computer but as you guys know I'm using DaVinci Resolve for most of my projects now so what I'll do is at the end of this video I'll talk about some of the components that I would choose differently if I was a Premiere Pro editor and that's just simply because Premiere Pro uses the processor just a little bit more than the GPU does on DaVinci Resolve so getting a better GPU for DaVinci Resolve users can be a little bit more advantageous than spending a little bit more money on the CPU CPU, and that may sound a little bit foreign to you, but just know that I'll probably use a different graphics card and a different processor if I was still editing on Premiere Pro. All right, man, so let's just get a few things out of the way before we even dig into this build. If right now you're watching this and you just feel like this is completely out of your realm, I just want to bring this into perspective for you just a little bit. All I'm going to be doing throughout this video is literally just taking a screwdriver unscrewing things and then screwing new things back into those things that we removed. Now, when we get to the part in the video where we talk about like how to wire the stuff or how to wire the case back into the motherboard, that's probably the most technical part of this entire build. And so I'll slow down and I'll literally just zoom into each piece. And once you actually see what's happening, I got a pretty good feeling that if you've never done it before, you'll be able to do it. And the main reason why I feel that it's important to be able to do this stuff, man, is because Apple's out there making these these computers that are like six thousand, seven thousand dollars, three, four thousand dollars, and you can easily just take a screwdriver and with just a little bit of knowledge and expertise, put some of this stuff together. If you've ever played with Legos when you were a kid, this is exactly like Legos, just like computer pieces. Instead of Legos, it's literally computer components. So when we're able to put together a system like this that can beat out like your latest MacBook or iMac or whatever, and it empowers us with the ability to be able to just edit faster and spend a whole lot less money. All right, so with all that out of the way, said and done, let's go ahead and jump straight into this build. Hey, look, man. Sometimes, sometimes I be like, I'm grinding hard as fuck. Gonna be on the wrong shit. If you flip your computer around to the back side, you'll see two screws that secure the side panel that allows you access to the inside of your computer. You can literally just unscrew these by hand. Once we get that panel off, that'll allow us access to the inside of our computer. And the first thing we're gonna jump into is starting to remove all of the wiring that's attached to the motherboard itself. You've got a bunch of power cables, you've got a bunch of fan cables, you have the hard drive cables themselves, which nowadays are typically SATA cables. These are the flat looking cables they are typically red or black. More importantly, we have the HDD plus and minus and the LED plus and minus cables. We'll get into that later. I'll explain that more in depth later on in the build. We also have a few USB as well as an audio cable to disconnect from the motherboard as well. The big box looking thing that's located pretty much in the middle of the motherboard. This is where your CPU is located. Typically there's an air cooled fan that kind of sits on top of it. In this specific build, I have a water cooler, but just, just think of replacing this water cooling block with something that looks like a radiator with a fan on top of it. If you look underneath and to the sides of these kind of heat sink with the fan on top, what you're gonna notice are two levers that you'll have to lift up and then you'll see two metallic clips that clip onto the actual motherboard itself. If you look at either the top or the bottom or to the flanks of the CPU, what you'll notice is like a lever where you'll be able to go ahead and lift up these levers and then unsecure the metallic portion from the actual plastic part that's attached to the motherboard itself. 
Each motherboard is slightly different, but for the most part, they're all pretty much generally the same. After we get the CPU cooler off, you can just kind of set it off to the side. And what you'll notice is a bunch of like glue looking stuff, which is actually thermal paste that helps cool down the CPU. Don't worry about all that. We'll go ahead and clean all this stuff off later. And I'll get a little bit more into detail on like what thermal paste I recommend you guys use and all that. I'll put links to all the stuff that we talk about in the description below so it's easy for you guys to access and resource. So as you can see here, I'm just finalizing the removal of all the wires and basically everything that's attached to the motherboard that comes from the computer case. You want to detach every single wire from the motherboard that's attached to any wire that's connected to the computer case itself. All right, so once we have all the wires that are coming from the case that are going into the motherboard, the next thing we're gonna do is take a Phillips head screwdriver and unscrew all of the screws that you see that are attaching the motherboard to the case. This part of the motherboard removal can get a little tricky because some of these screws look like other screws that attach other stuff, but just all you have to do is just look at basically the four corners. And in addition to those four corners, what you'll have is probably three or four other screws that are attaching the motherboard to the case. From there, we could just remove the motherboard from the case, and then we can transition over into removing the IO plate that's located on the back of the case, which houses all your USB ports and audio jacks. All right, so the next thing we'll do is we'll open up our brand new motherboard box. And the first thing we're gonna do is locate the new IO plate, the one that's gonna replace the old one. Once we locate this IO plate, we can simply just clip it back into the same position that the old one was in. This is where your Lego skills come in at, man. This is exactly the part I was talking about. This is the part where it's just like, you just literally connect everything like Legos. Here's what it sounds like when we know we have it in place. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is take our brand new motherboard and put it into the same position that the old one came out of. And then we're gonna identify where all those mounting points are and just line up those holes that are in the case to those holes on the motherboard as well. Let's go ahead and screw that motherboard back into place. The best way to do it is just go ahead and screw all these screws in until they feel just a little bit tight and then just go just a little bit past that just to make sure they don't back out or anything throughout any of the vibration that goes on through your fans or just Throughout the years that you're using it, you don't want your motherboard to like get loose or anything. Next is, you guessed it, we're gonna take all those wires that we originally disconnected from the old motherboard and then start to fit them back into the same exact ports that you disconnected the old one from. The reason why I'm not gonna name all these off is because they only go in one way. You can't screw this up. All you have to do is just match the pieces together. Okay, this is the part that kind of gets confusing. Hooking up the HDD LED plus reset switch power LED plus and minus, power switch and all that stuff. I don't know why they haven't standardized this into like the harness just like the rest of the cables are, but it's not. We have to actually go into our manual. Once we locate the manual, you're gonna go to a part that looks just like this. What this is is basically a code or a diagram that basically describes which pin attaches to which portion of the case wiring that comes from the case. All we have to do is look at this diagram and basically match up each one of these pieces pin for pin and wire for wire. What we're going to see is a portion of the motherboard with a bunch of pins sticking out of it that's in the same configuration that we just saw on the manual. If you look at the bottom portion of where these pins are, you'll see something that says JFP1. Looking back onto the manual, you'll also notice that it also says JPF1. So that's how you know this is kind of the same area of the motherboard in terms of, okay, now I have the code or the diagram, and now we have the portion of the motherboard that matches the diagram. 90% of the motherboards will look like this. You'll have five pins on one side and then four pins on the other. And then if you look at the diagram, you also have five pins on one side and four pins on the other. This is a really good indicator to make sure that you're plugging in these wires into the proper pins. There's no particular order to go in, but here's the order that we're gonna go in for this video. I'm gonna locate the wires that say HDD LED. Now within this particular pin, this houses the plus and the minus side of the LED, unlike the power LED, which is actually two different wires. But just know that this particular HDD LED wire houses two separate wires and one's plus and one's minus. And as long as we have the letters facing outward, then we know we have it in the right configuration. Looking back at our diagram, we can see that the HDD LED plus and minus pins are located on pins one and three. And just to make sure that we are plugging them into the right pins, 
Pins one and three are located on the opposite side of where that missing pin is, which is pin number 10. Now we can go over every single pin that we need to attach here, but I think you guys pretty much get the gist of it by this point. Let's go ahead and do the power LED plus and minus, and then we go into the reset switch and then your power switch. And it's all basically connecting the dots at this point in time. I'm pretty sure you can figure out the rest of these wires from here on out. But if you guys have any questions concerning this portion of the installation or your pins look different or you guys have a wire that's not in the diagram within this particular video, then you guys um, feel free to drop me a comment below, man. I probably run into every different type of configuration with all these different motherboard manufacturers and computer cases. So I may be able to steer you in the right direction. The next wire that we're gonna attach from the case to the motherboard is the HD audio. And if we look at the motherboard side, it also says audio or something having to do with audio. This harness only goes in one way. Notice by this footage here, you have a portion of this harness that has a missing pin. So it's literally impossible to put this in the wrong way. If you're finding difficulty with this going in, or it's just it's just not going in for some reason it's probably not going in the right way so so just take a look at the part that has the missing pin and then just line it up with the pin that's actually missing on the motherboard the next portion of the motherboard we'll look for is any part that says usb and then just like the audio harness coming from the computer case itself you'll notice a harness that says usb on it and then the same story you'll notice a missing pin and it only goes in one way these small little harnesses right here are fan harnesses. This is how all of the fans in your case get power coming off of the motherboard. All right, so now we get into the portion that can get a little bit tricky, especially if you have multiple hard drives. If you have multiple hard drives, you need to locate the hard drive that has your OS on it, whichever hard drive that has Windows on it. And if you only have one hard drive, then you're in luck because you just simply hook up that one hard drive back into the motherboard. Now, if you do have multiple hard drives and you don't know which one of the hard drives has your operating system on it. Later on in this tutorial, I'm gonna explain a way that we could kind of trial and error it so that we can get this new motherboard to identify which hard drive has your OS on it. So if you know which hard drive has your OS on it, go ahead and connect that SATA cable back into any one of the ports on the motherboard and only this hard drive itself. You don't want your motherboard trying to figure out which one of your hard drives has the OS on it. You don't want it trying to find another hard drive or multiple hard drives to try to figure out what your OS is on. You don't want any confusion um, for this new setup. Okay, so I didn't talk about actually removing the CPU from the motherboard, but in case you're completely unaware of never touched a CPU before, it's not like electromagnetic. It's not gonna shock you or anything, or you won't damage the CPU by touching it. So just go ahead and grab the CPU and just simply just remove it. We're gonna take our brand new CPU and we're gonna take a look at it. CPU is only going one way, just like everything else we've been talking about throughout this entire build. You're gonna notice a metal lever that attaches to where the CPU mounts onto the motherboard. Simply lift this lever up, all it's doing is releasing the portion that secures all the CPU pins onto the socket itself. Once we get our CPU to sit inside the socket, now we can lower down that lever, securing all of the CPU pins into place. The next thing we'll do is we're gonna clean off all of the old thermal paste that's on the old CPU heatsink. We're just gonna take some alcohol swabs or pads and just simply wipe it off. It'll come off really easy, no problems, no issues. This is the thermal paste I recommend to get. Just use this thermal paste. It will make your CPU run just a little bit cooler. When applying this thermal paste, all you're gonna do is apply small little portions of it like to the center and then a little bit over on the corners from the time we clamp our CPU cooler back down onto the CPU, all it needs is just a little bit amount of thermal paste and it'll spread evenly across the entire surface area of the CPU. Once we have the thermal paste applied, you could reinstall your CPU cooler in the same way that you took it off. There should be two latches on each side, along with the lever that actually secures and tightens these two clamps onto the CPU socket. And at this point, your CPU is installed onto the motherboard. The next thing we'll do is we'll take our graphics card out of its box, ensuring to remove the plastic that's protecting the slots. And then as we look over onto the motherboard side, you'll see either one PCIe slot or maybe two, depending on what type of motherboard you have. Without getting into a whole lot of detail about these slots, just make sure you're using the one that's closest to the CPU. Once we get our new graphics card installed, you simply just screw it in. You have two handheld screws that simply screw it into place on the back portion of the case where you see all the slots. The older graphics card that came out of this particular build 
was an NVIDIA 1060i. This is a slightly smaller graphics card. It was only a six gigabyte graphics card. This one's an eight. This one's a little bit faster and a little beefier. So this one requires more power as indicated right here by the additional eight pins for the additional power requirement for this graphics card. Now, if you purchase a graphics card that requires more power, you're going to need these extra four pins coming off of your power supply. You can also find these extra harnesses located inside your power supply box if you purchase your power supply separately or if not you can purchase this harness right here the next thing we're going to install is our ram they only go in one way and again just like 90 percent of these computer components it only goes in one way looking at the motherboard side where the ram goes in one thing i'll talk about really briefly before we put this ram in i would say about 75 to 80 percent of the motherboards i've run across that have four slots or also known as dual channel actually require you to put this RAM in a specific way. The most common way to install RAM onto motherboards that have four slots or two channels is to install these two sticks into slots one and three. So if you look at the slot that's closest to the CPU, that would be slot one. And then you would skip that next slot because that would be obviously slot two and then put that second stick of RAM into slot three. So if you did purchase this motherboard specifically, install them into slots one and three. If you have another motherboard, check the motherboard manufacturer or the motherboard manual, and it will tell you which slots to put them in if you're using two sticks of RAM, whether that's slots one and two or slots two and four. This is what the sticks of RAM should sound like when you're installing them onto the motherboard. All right, man, so after we get everything installed and plug back into the wall and we got power going into the computer and turn it on, this is the screen that I was met with. Now, if you weren't met by the screen, this probably means that you didn't hook the correct hard drive back into your motherboard. Unfortunately, what you're gonna have to do is go back into your computer and just kind of do a trial and error thing where you kind of just unplug that hard drive that you currently have connected to the motherboard, reconnect another one, Try turning the computer back on. Let's see if Windows is able to get kicked back on. And if not, then just simply rinse and repeat this process until Windows boots up. If your computer is working just fine before you took everything apart, then there should be no reason at all that once we do identify which hard drive has the OS on it, the motherboard should go ahead and pick it up and just continue to run just like your previous system. Now, if the computer just does not turn on at all, you probably have to go back to where all that HDD LED stuff and power LED plus and minus and just make sure that you go back to the diagram just to make sure all of these wires are properly connected to the motherboard. Now, once you do get Windows to come back on, what you'll notice is that the resolution just doesn't look right. And that's just simply because Windows hasn't had the opportunity to be able to update the drivers for the graphics card yet. If you're running Windows 10, this will happen automatically. You don't have to worry about it. Just let a couple minutes pass by, give Windows an opportunity to download those drivers for your new graphics card. And then what'll happen is your resolution will go back to its normal format. If it doesn't, just simply go to the manufacturer's website for whatever graphics card you bought. In this case, we're gonna go into the Radeon website, go into the drivers portion, and then just download the latest drivers just like you would normally do and then you should be good to go after that. And unless you're having any real difficulties hooking up your speakers or your ethernet's not actually working properly, then I really wouldn't worry about having to update these drivers. They typically don't get updates for sometimes a year or two at a time. Yo, it's good, man. Coming back from the gym, man, I didn't get a chance to talk over the, uh, the actual cost and all of that stuff um, from that computer build that we were doing last night. Uh, some of the costs that I kind of made up for, especially for like the motherboard and the RAM and stuff like that, I actually made up for by selling the stuff. And if it's windy, my bad. Uh, I'm just on my phone right now. But uh, I kind of made up for that cost by selling some of my older computer components. Um, so that I can get some of the newer stuff. Now the older AM3 Plus stuff that's on um, on the motherboard side, if you guys aren't aware of like, you know, the nomenclatures of the model numbers, just know that 
the stuff that I was using previously was like older generation AMD stuff in terms of like the motherboard and the CPU. And so I essentially just upgraded into the AM4, which is the current uh, generation of AMD motherboards and processors. So yeah, man, I, that's what I recommend y'all do, man. I recommend y'all upgrade like your motherboards and your processors and stuff um, as soon as possible. That way you can get the most amount of money for this stuff um, on the used market. That way you can take that money Put it towards the newer generation stuff and it's the same thing i tell everybody for the cameras man like for me i got the p4k the p6k is already out i'm looking at upgrading to the 6k because like every second that goes by in the digital world that old stuff is like depreciating in value like tremendously so the most amount of money you can get for these older bodies i think the better it will be for you and then you can take that money roll it over into the newer stuff that way you can stay up to date on all of your camera stuff and all that man uh, but anyway yeah man so i ended up spending only about i spent about less than 200 dollars, man overall like i talked about before or if i didn't talk about it i spent about 400 dollars for all of those computer components and uh yeah this is clipping i know this is probably clipping overexposed and shit <laughs> no nah, but i spent about i just say about 200 dollars. i spent about 200 dollars for all those new computer components and then i sold all the older stuff for about $200 um, to a friend actually right here uh, in the local area. So I really only spent about $200 for all that new computer stuff. And so um, I think it's a pretty good deal, man. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning into this video, man. If you guys have any questions about any of the products that we talked about um, within this video, don't forget to hit me up on SCG Filmmakers um, on Instagram. I'll be more than glad to help you out if I can answer those questions. And once again, all of the components that I use for this build specifically, I'll link in the description below. Anyways, man, enjoy the rest of your 2019 filmmaking experience, and I'll see y'all in 2020. Actually, now I'll put out, like, another video before 2020s. Hopefully. Anyway, so I'll see y'all next time, man. Peace. That slow grind be the best, nigga. That slow grind be the best. action. Keep the law of final attraction. I be on hard mode like reciprocal fractions. I set it all on the